All right, I'm going to ask everyone to please be seated. We're going to begin. All righty, good morning. I'm Donovan Richards, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, and today we are joined by uh, members of the committee. I'll acknowledge them first, Vincent Gentili, uh, Dan Garodnik, Jamani Williams, Richie Torres, Antonio Reynoso. I did see Councilmember Gradenchik as well. We're also joined by Perkins, Cumbo, okay, and, and Kalos and Lander. All righty, whoever else comes in. Today we will be voting on five applications. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, four applications. Uh, the East Harlem Neighborhood Rezoning in Sendero Verde, the Special Harlem River Waterfront District Zoning Text Amendment, and the East River 50 Sutton Place Zoning Text Amendment. We'll be voting to modify the East Harlem Neighborhood Rezoning application, land use item number 773 through 775, to reduce densities and heights along portions of Park, Lexington, 3rd and 2nd Avenue to better respond to neighborhood context and minimize risk of displacement of rent stabilized units. The council is also removing Eugene McCabe Field in a church site from the rezoning area, modifying the non-residential requirements along Park Avenue and changing the MIH options, removing option number two and adding the deep affordability option. We'll be also voting to modify the Sendero Verde application land use item number 776 through 782 to restrict the disposition of city-owned land to require that a minimum of 11,450 square feet of lot area be devoted to community garden or passive recreation use and a minimum of an additional 18,000 square feet to be devoted to use as publicly accessible open space. We will be also voting to approve a related tax exemption uh, for land use item number 790. So I want to uh, welcome the speaker. She's going to uh, give remarks and, and congratulate her on uh, a job well done, not that we expected anything less. And, you know, one of the things I want to say is, you know, we, we also often hear uh, negative stories on a lot of the rezonings going on uh, around the city, but we, we don't necessarily always hear the positive stories that are happening. So I think between uh, 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 preserving affordability, creating new affordable, uh, deep affordability options, uh, and, and major investment, we are striking the right uh, balance with this rezoning, and it could not have been done uh, without the leadership of the speaker, but more importantly, as well, the community. Uh, and I want you to know that she's taken as much, <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of debate around this rezoning, um, a, a lot of controversy, but she really uh, genuinely listened to each and every one uh, of her constituents through this process, and I'm, I'm proud to uh, serve under her. So I will now turn it over to Speaker Melissa Mark Favorito. Thank you, Chair Richards, uh, and good morning, well, good afternoon at this point to everyone. Uh, today's vote is a major victory for the El Barrio East Harlem community and the culmination of a two-year community planning process that saw thousands of residents, business owners, local stakeholders, and electeds come together and develop a shared vision for the future of this neighborhood. I want to thank everyone who participated and devoted their time and energy to this process, to Councilmember Bill Perkins, to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Community Board 11, members of the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan Steering Committee, and Mayor de Blasio and his staff. The steering committee was formed in 2015 when Mayor Bill de Blasio proposed to rezone areas throughout the city, including East Harlem, to create new opportunities for more affordable housing. I've always been a believer in participatory governance and inclusive planning and believe that local input and vision would be critical in developing a strong planning framework. The steering committee hosted a series of community visioning workshops where residents shared their ideas and concerns on a broad range of topics, including housing, economic development, arts and culture, health, open space, education and transportation. This process led to the creation of the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan in February 2016, which included over 200 recommendations to guide the future zoning and community investments for the neighborhood and to respond to the challenges facing East Harlem today. East Harlem is a diverse community with tremendous cultural, social, and historic resources that have positioned the neighborhood for development and growth. But rapid growth can also threaten the diversity and affordability that has helped shape and define the fabric of the community. In recent years, 
El Barrio East Harlem has lost 360 affordable units per year due to expiring subsidy programs, while market rate housing is being developed without any affordability requirements. The loss of affordable housing is one of the most pressing concerns for the neighborhood and requires a policy response using all the tools available. A strategy to preserve the affordable housing in a neighborhood that is already affordable to most of the residents living in it is critical. Last year, this council passed mandatory inclusionary housing, a landmark law which requires developers to set aside a percentage of new development as permanently affordable. Today's vote will apply MIH to East Harlem and ensure that at least 20 to 25 percent of all new residential units in private development will be permanently affordable and available to low-income New Yorkers. Development on public sites will reach even deeper with 100 percent affordability and lower AMI bans. For instance, the Sendero Verde project will provide 680 units of 100% affordable housing and will have 30% of the units at 30% AMI and below and will have 80% of units at 80% of AMI, AMI or below. The project will also provide over 100,000 square feet of community facility space, including a new YMCA, a new charter high school run by DREAM, new space for Union Settlement at Mount Sinai, and nearly 30,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space and community garden uses. This is the type of project we can see on publicly owned sites. As we worked through the East Harlem rezoning, we examined the additional density and height required to trigger MIH and wrestled with the inherent tension between the scale of buildings and the ability to maximize MIH affordable units. Much of the negotiations over the past seven months have centered around this tension, and I'm happy to announce the agreement we reached that places density and height in the areas best able to accommodate it while substantially reducing building scale throughout the proposal particularly on Park and Third Avenues. The Council modified the rezoning plan to align more closely to the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan, triggering AMIH while preserving the character of the community and evaluated the location of vulnerable rent-stabilized housing to minimize displacement pressure. While many of the conversations during the planning process have focused on housing creation, the plan goes far beyond Beyond that, to include an unprecedented series of capital and programmatic commitments that were advocated for by the East Harlem Neighborhood Plan Steering Committee. I want to thank the de Blasio administration for their efforts to address the goals of the Neighborhood Plan. These commitments ensure that comprehensive community development will accompany the rezoning and includes a historic $50 million investment in repairing NYCHA public housing in East Harlem. Developing new affordable housing on city-owned sites identified through the neighborhood planning process. Creating a proactive and coordinated system to preserve affordable housing and protect tenants. Establishing a certificate of no harassment program to deter tenant harassment. Redeveloping the historic La Marqueta. Building new parkland at the East River Esplanade and repair existing sections and open a new Satellite Workforce One Center to connect resident to employment services, as well as investing in job training and local hiring. Those are just some examples of the community investments. In particular, I want to thank the staff that has worked tirelessly for the past two and a half years to get us to today's vote. I want to thank George Sarkissian, Roger Mann, Chelsea Kelly, Rebecca Crimmins, Jeff Yuen, Dylan Casey, and Joe Toronto. Again, I want to commend everyone who participated in this process. I want to invite my colleagues uh, to join me in supporting these applications, both the Sendero Verde and the East Harlem rezoning, uh, as we celebrate a major achievement for El Barrio East Harlem. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my colleagues. Thank you. We will next be voting to approve with modifications land use item number 785 and 786, the Special Harlem Waterfront District expansion. We will be voting to modify the text of the Special Harlem River Waterfront District expansion to require that some sites comply with the new rules that would previously have been applicable to the sites and to introduce a CPC authorization that would allow for a waiver of the required setback from the Deegan Expressway on certain sites. 
uh, to Speaker left, um, so she won't give remarks on that, but uh, she urges you to vote yes on that. We'll be voting to also modify pre-considered land use item number East, uh, land use East River 50, Sutton Place, an application for a zoning text amendment by the East River 50s Alliance. This a text amendment would establish a modified version of the standard tower on a base regulations for certain zoning lots in R10 districts, roughly bounded by the Queensboro Bridge, First Avenue, East 51st Street, and the East River in Community Board 6 in Manhattan. The council will be modifying this zoning text to remove the grandfathering provision added by the City Planning Commission to cover a specific development which is out of scale and character for this neighbor neighborhood. The IRFA application was in the works for many years, was the subject of substantial press coverage, and did not take this development by surprise. The development continues to have the standard recourse already provided under the city's existing zoning regulations to appeal to the BSA for more time to vest. I will now turn to Council Member Kalos, but I want to thank Kalos and Garodnik uh, for their support on this application as well. Council Member Kalos. Thank you, Chair Donovan Richards. Good morning. I represent the densest census tracts in America. For a sense of density, after subway stations at Penn Station, my district, which is not a transportation hub, has the next busiest subway station in the city. A once quiet Upper East Side filled with brownstone walk-ups is being raised for taller buildings of two to 400 feet with no affordable housing. Three-bedroom condominiums start at five million on East End Avenue. And if that wasn't bad enough, I started to see ultra-luxury apartments with 16-foot ceilings coming in at $12 million for the same three-bedroom at 180 East 88th Street. Uh, that's a monthly mortgage of $50,000 a month and not something anyone short of billionaires and foreign investors can afford. Displacing rent-regulated residents in affordable housing in order to build super tall buildings for billionaires to use to store their money is robbing our city of light, air, and perhaps most valuable, the people who made it so great. As soon as I got elected, I met with the city, land use, city council land use team, Department of City Planning, the borough president, even deputy mayors, asking all of them, how can we stop the march of buildings for billionaires from commercial districts in 57th Street to residential neighborhoods and actually build affordable housing? In a district that had already been upzoned to the limits of the law, I suggested trading height for affordability, capping Ezra Wright development at 210, and offering additional 50 feet of height and affordable area for affordable housing and community facilities like badly needed schools. One year later, in April 2015, as children collected Easter eggs in Sutton Place Park, I learned that rent-regulated tenants were being displaced, and a developer was raising money for a proposed super tall tower at 950 feet for my district. The first super tall had started with many, many more to come. I went right to work publishing opinion editorials, organizing buildings, and within 45 days, Community Board 6 passed a resolution calling for a height cap in the mid-block of the East 50s of 75 feet, as are present everywhere else in the district. Not one to wait for the Department of City Planning. Uh, on the Community Board 6's request, we uh, began going to dozens of buildings, raising money for community-led rezoning. We formed the East River 50s Alliance, which has grown to 45 buildings in the area, 2,600 individuals from 500 buildings all over the city with support from friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, Civitas, and city-wide organizations like the Municipal Arts Society. Councilmember Dan Garodnik, Senator Liz Kruger, Manhattan Borough President uh, Gail Brewer joined me as co-applicant applicants and Congressmember Cal Maloney has joined in support. We worked with the Department of City Planning on several options providing for affordable housing as part of a proposal. DCP has ultimately advised that with the change to a tower on base zoning, the most effective way to produce affordable housing was to use the existing inclusionary housing framework, which is what we have done. I'm pleased that the DCP has committed to reviewing and making the changes to the inclusionary housing framework citywide, which will help us further incentivize affordable housing that our community is eager to see built in the East 50s. We would later pass mandatory inclusionary housing in the council, tracking closely to my initial proposal, though it did not include a bonus to build schools, which we hope we can come back and get. We spent 18 months in pre-application from 2015 following our pre-application in January of 2016 and finally receiving permission to file our application in February of 2017. We filed the zoning proposal with the 210-foot as of right height cap, 260 feet with affordable housing community facilities like schools. 
During our pre-application, the original developer never finished raising the money they needed for this planned development. They declared bankruptcy and a new developer bought the property and air rights earlier this year. This 18-month delay would no longer be possible under legislation the Council recently passed, meaning this zoning could have been over and done with long before the current developer took position, possession. After months of review by City Planning, it was finally certified in June. We had two community board hearings, the borough president passing resolutions in support. During the review process, the City Planning Chair wrote a letter opposing our voluntary designated inclusionary housing Proposal and directed us to submit a proposal for tower on base on the grounds that existing inclusionary housing program would result in more affordable housing. It is important to note that the chair's proposal did not include a grandfathering provision. We submitted the chair's recommendation expecting an expedient uh, process. Uh, on November 15th, the City Planning Commission voted on our rezoning. Uh, with the erroneous inclusion of a grandfather provision, I'm asking my colleagues to modify the application as we initially submitted it and as the City Planning Chair initially recommended. Your vote today is in support of real housing for real New Yorkers and will protect octogenarians like Herndon Worth and seniors like Charles Fernandez and his sister who face displacement from their rent-regulated units from billionaires building buildings for other billionaires. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Kalis will now go to, now go to Councilmember Garodny. Thank you very much, Chair Richards, uh, for holding a vote on this rezoning application today. And I also want to thank everybody who came yesterday to testify on this proposal, uh, to my colleagues on the committee, and of course to Council Member Kalos, who has been a great leader in this effort. Uh, as he noted, I am a co-applicant on this application, as part of it falls in my council district, and I'm very proud to have been part of this community-driven effort. I'm not going to repeat what Councilmember Kalos has said, other than to observe that this application is the result of a Herculean effort on the part of the local community, who feel that they should have a say in the kinds of buildings that go up around them and the kind of neighborhood that they want to live in. They have brought neighbors together, raised money, engaged lawyers and planners, and developed a strong proposal, a plan that preserves the neighborhood feel of the area while allowing thoughtful, contextual development. This application, when it arrived at the Council, differed in an important way from the application that was originally filed. The City Planning Commission added a grandfathering clause that would exempt from the rezoning a site in the heart of the proposed rezoning district. I've heard the arguments for and against the grandfathering provision and, of course, I am very familiar with the application itself, and I support the removal of that provision from the application as it will be voted on today. This well-considered community plan deserves to stand as a whole. Again, I thank my colleagues on the committee, of course, uh, Councilmember Kalos and Senators Kruger uh, and Borough President uh, Brewer for uh, their uh, joining us in this application, and I encourage everybody to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All righty, do any of the subcommittee members have any questions or statements on any of these applications? Barry? No. Okay. <laughs> All right, seeing none, okay, I will now call on a vote with the support of uh, the local council members on land use items number 790 and to approve with the modifications I have described land use items number 773 through 775, 776 through 782, Preconsidered land use East River 50 Tex Amendment and 785 through 8 through 786. Council, please call the roll. Chair Richards. I uh, want to say congratulations to all. Uh, very proud today to add East Harlem uh, to the list of neighborhood rezonings that have been approved by this council, which are really going to uh, leverage and preserve new affordable housing in both old and investment. Uh, I think we add East Harlem to Far Rockaway now and to East New York. And uh, with that, I'm very proud of the work that uh, the committee has done on these items. With that, I vote aye. Gentilly. I also want to uh, congratulate all, particularly uh, Council Members Kalos and Gorodnik. Uh, contextual um, considerations for a neighborhood is very important to me, uh, as I've worked on that in my neighborhood on a totally different scale, but totally in my neighborhood uh, back in 2005 and then again in 2007. Um, and that has worked well for my neighborhood. So I congratulate both of you, and I proudly vote I and all. Gorodnik. Thank you. Vote aye. Williams. Pass. Reynoso. 
Reynoso. I vote aye. Torres. I vote aye. Gredenchik. Aye. Williams. May I excuse me my vote? Yes, sir. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be voting aye on all with the exemption of Preconsidered LU East River 50s and Sutton Place, and I want to ex explain why. Um, I actually think uh, both uh, colleagues, and in particular uh, Ben Carlos, uh, did a, a good job on this. I'm trying to remain consistent on the positions I've, I've taken in the past. Um, I think one council, uh, the speaker, I think, did a, a fantastic job. Uh, I, I support contextual zoning. I'm going through some of those in my district as well. Uh, my philosophy generally is if you're going to take away some height, uh, you need to give some height someplace else because we do need the height to be built. And or at least if there's a rezoning, there should be a, some affordable component in there. Uh, and the speakers, for instance, uh, she took away some height someplace and she gave some height somewhere else uh, in exchange for affordability. I'm trying to do something similar in my district. I haven't got a good reason why MIH hasn't applied here uh, or why we have no component for affordability. Um, with all the hard work that I know that was put in, I'm going to have to abstain on uh, preconsidered LU East River 50 Sutton Place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the land use items are approved by a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero exemptions, except for pre-considered LU East River 50s, which is approved by a vote of six in the affirmative, zero negative, and one abstention. And these items are all referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Land use is following up. Uh, this hearing is now closed. <laughs>